Welcome to episode 10 of Kevin Across America. This week, I'm in Roanoke, nestled in Virginia's Blue Ridge Mountains. Nick Shell, executive director of Pinball, might have the most interesting job in Roanoke. Yeah, we do try to have a mix of old and new here. So Shell left the corporate world to manage the Roanoke Pinball Museum. It has around 70 machines dating back to the 1930s. The oldest machine is actually right up at the front here. It's called Try a Light. And you can see the spelling up here, Try a Light, because it's three. Every time you get three, and a triangle, it will light the bulb that uh, is enclosed by the balls that you get. This is from 1935, and back in the day, this was quite a novelty because it had electricity. Metallica, Doctor Who, and the Munsters among the dozens of themed rectangular boxes, ready to catapult you back to childhood. Each game is kind of a time capsule in terms of Americana and pop art. And as you move through the through the decades, you can kind of see how things change. And once we get into the 80s and 90s, they start licensing movies, like The Addams Family over there, Gilligan's Island, and so forth. But before then, uh, they kind of made them up as they went, like this fireball and bow and arrow. These are your flippers, and when you press the button, you see that it actually pulls in here. Half artwork, half engineering, Shell showed me the elaborate underbelly of a pinball machine. And sometimes we have to make them. Sometimes we have to actually build the parts to be replaced. Video games and arcades wreaked havoc on the pinball industry during the 1980s. And it's like a little, little theme park, you know, underneath glass. But the love for lights, bumpers, and ramps has become cool again. They are still making machines, and they can't seem to make them fast enough because they are selling out and making them as fast as possible. Even at five, six, seven, eight, ten, twelve thousand dollars, they are still selling like crazy. People love having these things. It's kind of a, really kind of a status symbol if you think about it. Having a machine like this in your house, you know, this is an amazing, amazing toy. For Shell, pinball is a physical experience that a TV, phone, nor computer can replicate. Sometimes when you lose the ball, you'll hear the music go, um, um, Dun, 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 and then the flippers will go clink, clink, kind of like that. I asked Shell. And then over here you have Captain Fantastic with Elton John. To share a little known museum fact. This Gilligan's Island is special because it turns out uh, Dreama Denver is Bob Denver's widow. And Bob Denver, of course, was Gilligan in the, in the TV series. Well, she lives in West Virginia. She came over here to visit us. And while she was here, she signed this translate is kind of a, one of those little things, little Easter eggs that we have hidden in the museum. The Pinball Museum is on the second floor of Center in the Square, a building filled with other small museums in the heart of downtown Roanoke. <laughs> Tickets are $10 for kids between the ages of 2 and 10 and $13.50 for anyone older. That gives you unlimited access to every machine. Where'd the ball go there? The museum also does parties, weddings, and monthly membership plans. And for a city of any size, this is already a pretty impressive collection, but especially for Roanoke. So, uh, so we're pretty proud of, of that. Open 24-7, the Texas Tavern is a Roanoke institution. You leave your status outside, you come in, we treat you like a millionaire. So. Matt Bullington's great-grandfather opened the No Frills restaurant in 1930 during the height of the Great Depression. In those days, fast food was a novelty. And if you look at the original White Castles, it's just a, st a stainless steel counter. Inside are the white walls. Maybe you had little castle turrets. Well, my great-grandfather picked a chili recipe up in San Antonio what's the most famous old building in downtown San Antonio. It's got a little arch, it's the Alamo. So that's why he did that, like that, is like a little homage to Texas Tavern, the Alamo. 
The cash-only establishment has 10 red and white stools. It jokes that it seats a thousand people, but only 10 at a time. White collar, blue collar, no collar, saints, sinners, preachers, prostitutes, everyone in between. It's a temple of democracy. You know, you may have a judge sitting next to a guy that just got out of jail, sitting next to a banker, sitting next to a little old lady, a couple of kids, and a hell's angel. Everyone. It's all walks of life. They're all kind of in here rubbing elbows. That was more or less my experience when I stopped in late Saturday night. My girlfriend and I ordered a hamburger, hot dog, bowl of chili, two sodas, and a cheesy western. The total was like $20 with the tip. I often tell people, you know, with new employees, say, listen, you're like a bartender without the alcohol. We don't serve alcohol. <laughs> we got plenty of people maybe even drinking late at night. We're our job is to sober them up. But you want to have an affability. You want to talk to them, joke with them. Because as people come here for the food, they come here for the ambiance, kind of like, man, the place hasn't changed. But they also like the banter back and forth where you know, employees are kidding around you know, with the customers. That's a big element of it. That's really important. Aside from the cash register, security camera system, soda machine, and the people behind the counter, not much has changed since the Texas Tavern first opened 92 years ago. He got a lot of his, hey Chris, he got a lot of Bullington his. confessed, that's by design. I like to call us a, um, a, a cultural mooring. Everything changes so fast. Everything's homogenated, cookie cutter. People crave places that are authentic, that are unique. It's worked for us for 92 years. I stopped at three other restaurants while in Roanoke and would recommend them all. The first, Crescent City Bourbon and Barbecue. I ordered the three meat platter with two sides for $32. The waitress brought a big serving of pulled pork, pulled chicken, sliced brisket, green beans, and mashed potatoes. The bar has an extensive bourbon and whiskey collection, and there's a nice outdoor dining area. Number two, Jack Brown's Beer and Burger Joint. It sources its 100% American Wagyu beef burgers from a family-owned and operated business in Boise, Idaho. Jack Brown's, which has 16 locations across the southeast, has a punk grunge feel to it. The total, with two burgers, two beers, fries, and tip, was around 50 bucks. And number three, local roots in Roanoke's Grandin Village. The menu lists the growers, farmers, and purveyors the restaurant sources from. I ordered the Bramble Hollow Chicken with rice and sautéed kale. My girlfriend had the pork chop with pumpkin al braised cabbage and roasted baby potatoes. With one round of drinks, dessert, and tip, the total came to $115. Roanoke has a growing brewery scene. On Saturday night, I visited Big Lick Brewing Company and Golden Cactus Brewing. They're right across the street from one another in what feels like the apex of a hip new neighborhood. Golden Cactus is located inside of an old soda factory and brews weekly. It is covered in color with tons of succulents and cactuses. Golden Cactus describes itself as visiting your grandma's greenhouse on a warm spring day. It has three pinball machines, a place to play video games, and a great outdoor space. A local band named Liv Sloan and the Diehards were playing in the beer garden at Big Lick Brewing Company. Stringed lights, four sitting areas with fire features, and cornhole games made for a really warm and lively environment. I ordered my beers in the tap room where there's more seating, a little stage, and a foosball table. The beers run the gamut with lagers, sours, IPAs, ales, and more. You can order food from nearby Tuco's Taqueria or Beamer's 25 restaurants, which will deliver right to your table at Big Lick.
On Sunday morning, I drove up Mill Mountain in the rain. It's a big urban park most well known for the Roanoke Star. At 88 feet tall, it's the world's largest man-made illuminated star and a serious point of pride for the region. In 1949, a local sign company designed and built what was supposed to be a seasonal Christmas decoration. But the star became an instant hit, and so, the city decided to keep it in place year-round. The Roanoke Star is connected to a steel structure. It has 2,000 feet of neon tubes and sits more than 1,000 feet above the city. Every evening, up until midnight, the star is lit up bright white. However, for five holidays each year, including the 4th of July, the star is red, white, and blue as a sign of patriotism. There's a viewing platform right below the star where people can gaze out over the Roanoke Valley. Mill Mountain also has a little zoo that takes about 45 minutes or so to cover. The zoo's animals include a red panda, bald eagle, black bear, and some more common ones like pigs, goats, and a raccoon. The zoo is open seven days a week. Tickets are between $8 and $10 per person. Natural Bridge State Park is an easy 40-minute drive northeast of Roanoke. Cedar Creek, a modest mountain stream, ate away at this massive body of limestone, in turn creating the Natural Bridge. It stands 215 feet tall and is 100 feet wide. The bridge is taller than Niagara Falls. Etta Finehour works at the Visitor Center Information Desk. She told me the King of England sold Thomas Jefferson the land in 1774 for $2.40. That was two years before the U.S. even gained its independence. Jefferson kept the property until he died. It then bounced between private hands up until 2016, when the state of Virginia turned the natural bridge into a state park. Well, one of the things I like to tell people is that Thomas Jefferson built a cabin here, and it's approximately where the hotel stands right now. And he used to like to show off his bridge. He'd bring his, his friends to the bridge. He built, purposely built a two-bedroom cabin so he could have company. And they used to lower people down from the top of the bridge to them to see it. Really? Yeah. Which I wouldn't do. <laughs> Legend has it George Washington surveyed the site as a young man two decades before Jefferson ever purchased it. The story goes Washington scaled some 23 feet up this gray limestone wall and then carved out his initials, which you can still see today. Yet Feinauer said she's a bit skeptical. I'll leave that up to the historians to figure out whether that's really true. George Washington was a surveyor. I don't know if he ever surveyed this bridge. So. Natural Bridge State Park spans 1,500 acres, has seven miles of hiking trails, and is open year-round. A mission is $9 for anyone 13 and older and $6 for kids ages 3 to 12. Before leaving, make sure to drive across the Natural Bridge using Virginia Route 11. The National D-Day Memorial is another solid option for a day trip. It's around 40 minutes east of Roanoke. So we're going to head down this way. Emma Jean Morris took me on an hour-long tour of the memorial and explained why it's located in the tiny town of Bedford, Virginia. We had the dubious honor of having had the highest per capita loss of any community across the country on D-Day itself. We lost these 19 young men in the first 15 minutes, basically, of the beach invasion. 
one more later that day. You have a community of only, it was about 3,200 people. That's a really heavy burden to bear. The memorial is broken into four sections. We began in an English garden. A sculpture of General Dwight D. Eisenhower stands within this folly. A tile mosaic above Eisenhower's head depicts his bold and complex D-Day invasion plan. He actually carried a handwritten note in his pocket on D-Day where if it failed, he was going to take personal responsibility and resign. That's a leader. There are six busts in the garden. Morris referred to the men as Eisenhower's war cabinet. They were in the room when Eisenhower gave the go. The large plaque that we have here, this is Eisenhower's order of the day. The retired teacher is going to give you a homework assignment. If you go to YouTube and you plug in Eisenhower's order of the day, you can hear him deliver this. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. In company with our brave allies and brothers in arms on other fronts, you will bring about the destruction of the German war machine, the elimination of Nazi tyranny over the oppressed peoples of Europe, and security for ourselves in a free world. Good luck. And let us all beseech the blessing of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. The memorial's second section uses this large plaza to symbolize troops crossing the English Channel to Normandy, France. The Bedford Boys, as they're called, were part of Company A. It was almost the lowest of low tide. They had a beach the depth of at least three football fields to cross with virtually no cover. How did anybody make it? It just amazes me. Company A goes in on D-Day with, D with 170 men. By the end of the day, 91 dead, 64 wounded. This will leave 15 to fight another day. They're just decimated with that. Bronze plaques along the plaza bear the names of the more than 4,400 Allied service members that were killed on D-Day. One side lists all of the American names. The opposite side contains the names from all of the other allied nations. Uh, that's our bullets going off, to be like bullets hitting the water. The curved structures with the darkened windows are to be like the German bunkers, and they just wipe us out. There are no waterfalls on the beaches. That's there for noise. Nothing, I'm sure, compared to real life, but it gives you a little bit more of the feel for it. Uh, the tan for our beach, it's my understanding, we do have some sand from Normandy mixed in with that. A triumphal arch stands in the memorial's third section, with the word Overlord inscribed on its facade. That was the official operation name for D-Day. The black and white stripes recall the pattern Allied forces put on their aircraft to prevent friendly fire. It is 44 feet 6 inches for June 6th of 1944. It is remarkable the details that have been built in. There are flags for all 12 allied nations, big and small, that took part in D-Day. Our flag comes first in the position of honor. The rest then are in alphabetical order. So Australia, the next one is Belgium. So many times I have visitors want to say, oh, that's Germany. I'm like, really? Think about that one. No. Uh, Canada, as close as you can get today to Czechoslovakia, then France. On the other side, Greece, Netherlands, New Zealand, Norway, Poland, and the United Kingdom. The memorial's fourth and final section contains a copy of a sculpture that honored 42 men from a small French town killed during the span of World War I. Then over two decades later, on D-Day of all days, she was hit, she was knocked over, she was damaged. And our copy shows the same damage, missing part of the face, the jaw, the neck uh, with that. Uh, the reason they left the damage was to be a constant reminder of how fragile peace is. The National D-Day Memorial is open year round. But there's plans to add so much more. It's free for World War II veterans, active duty military, and kids under the age of six. Tickets for everyone else are between six and $10 online.
Roanoke is located along I-81 in southwest Virginia. By car, it's three hours from Charlotte, four hours from D.C., and seven hours from both New York City and Atlanta. Four airlines fly in and out of the Roanoke Blacksburg Regional Airport to major hubs, including Atlanta, Chicago, Charlotte, D.C., and Philadelphia. Amtrak also serves Roanoke with the train station right in the heart of downtown. It sits at the end of one leg along Amtrak's popular Northeast Regional Line. The ride from Roanoke to Washington, D.C.'s Union Station takes right around five hours. When I visited in November of 2022, Amtrak had two daily departures and two daily arrivals. With only two days in Roanoke, I didn't make it to every place on my list. That included the Taubman Museum of Art. It's a futuristic looking building in the heart of downtown. The museum has 10 galleries, a tall glass atrium, plus an interactive art space for kids. The Taubman is free, but heads up, it's only open on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. Right across the railroad tracks, sits the Hotel Roanoke and Conference Center. Originally built in 1882, the Tudor-style property has hosted dozens of politicians and celebrities. Eisenhower, Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan, and George W. Bush have all stayed here. Black Dog Salvage is a 40,000-square-foot warehouse stocked with antiques and unique items. The DIY network featured the business for eight years on the hit show Salvage Dogs. It's become quite a destination. The Grandin Theater is nearly 100 years old and plays both new and vintage films on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. The Grandin shuddered a few times over the decades, but now appears to be on solid footing. Movie tickets are between $8 and $10. Roanoke calls itself the star city of the South. It's clean, safe, laid back. We just want to spread the joy of pinball, really. And the people are noticeably friendly. Because I had a couple from New Orleans last week. My only mistake was not staying for an extra day. I don't think you can imagine that we're still here. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't imagine that. Right, for sure. If you enjoyed this video, subscribe to my travel journalism channel, hit the like button, and leave a comment below. My next journey, a 16-hour overnight Amtrak ride from Jacksonville, Florida to Washington, D.C. For now, from Roanoke in Virginia's Blue Ridge Mountains, I'm Kevin across America.